everyone has a story, a story of who we are. Our stories build on those of our parents and our grandparents and those who came before them. Cities too have stories of the people who settled there and built them and treasured them. Among the people who settled in Washington, D.C. early in the last century were Jewish immigrants and their families. Many had fled persecution in Eastern Europe and came here to make a better life. Here are some of their stories and those of their children who grew up American. I like to say they had a parade and the fireworks and all kinds of things. The Grossbergs are here, <laughs> July the 4th, 1909. And that's when we came to this country. I was 11 years old. Well, my father came over. He sold soap from a pushcart. His first work was actually uh, what today we might call a chicken flicker, picking chickens for 10 cents an hour. He was an immigrant. His uh, English was extremely poor. So he was here first, and this aunt of mine set him up in a little grocery store right across the street from the Navy Yard. Well, all it required of $50 to open up a junk shop. I guess the rent was maybe $20 a month. And so that's what he did. I delivered newspapers in the morning, and after school I sold chewing gum. Newspapers usually, they went for three cents, so very often a big sport would give you a nickel and tell you to keep the change. And my other brother was working somewhere, my sister worked at night, uh, Saturday night to, to cashier in some store, and each of us managed to bring in a few pennies. All of us worked in the store in those days. He was about 55, and he couldn't learn the language, and so one of us kids had to go to the shop and do the talking, see. And in those days, they waited on you. You didn't go and pick things off of the shelves. You said, I want a can of peaches, I want a can of sardines, and everything was brought to you, and each customer was taken care of as an individual. So you close at 11 o'clock, and then there's a customer knocked on the door and said they needed a loaf of bread. And it was 10 after 11, you didn't say the store was closed, as you get now. You went in the back, and you gave them a loaf of bread. You hoped they wouldn't want a bag, for that was half your profit. It was a very small store. We lived above the store, in back of the store, in rather cramped quarters. There was no bathroom inside. We had to go outside. I don't know if it was the middle of the night or the daytime, but we had to go outside in the backyard. There was an outhouse. Now, I remember when we were very little, we had gas lamps and mantles. You know what a mantle is? They would put newspapers in the stove, and on top of that, they would put some kindling wood. And when the blaze became strong, then they would lay on a layer of coal. And then whatever had to be cooked was laid on top of the stove and watched carefully because there was no way of controlling the temperature. And if you turned around a little too late, it may all have been burned. The telephone didn't look anything like today's instrument. It was sort of a perpendicular tube on a base, and you talked into a mouthpiece. The earpiece was on a wire that you'd hold up to your ear. Well, when you lifted the receiver, an operator asked, what number do you wish? And she would get it for you. And our number then was just 954. <laughs> and if you were lucky, you got through to the number you wanted. Frequently, the telephones were party lines, which meant two, and even uh, occasionally, there could be more than two people on the line. If you picked up and the other party was on the line, well, you either listened in or you hung up. We were allowed two calls a day on a party line. If you did more, why well, you paid a nickel. And that was a lot of money to make a call. And I remember that my brother built a little radio. The only station we could get was KDKA from Pittsburgh. 
There were no refrigeration, no air conditioning in those days, and uh, only we used to buy bricks of ice and put it in the in, in the ice box. That's where you kept things cold. In the summertime, we used to many nights go to Haynes Point to sleep because it was too hot to sleep in the house. We used to take pillows and blankets and go lay down in the, by the by the river, and then we would go to sleep and come back in the morning. I was one year old, and we moved to the store at 12th and S. Now, that was high-class living. We had a bathroom with a tub and a sink. And I remember we all spoke Yiddish, and in 1924, my father started Americanization school. And he came home, and in Yiddish he says, was Kinderlach, darfst reden English. Ich darf lernen English which means, children, you have to start talking to me in English because I have to take tests in Americanization school so I want to know how to speak English. And of course, they used to get the forewords, which they read diligently. Women used to write in, could the authorities find their husbands who had come over to America and they had never heard from them again? Or a woman came to America with, with her child only to realize that her husband had divorced her and what should she do? My mother, she watched over her children like everyone was a baby. And uh, it was beautiful, it really. Uh, and it, was, it was so relaxed, no tension. I mean, I got punched, I got, a, I, should, I got hit some once in a while by my father because it was coming to me. I know that, you know, I, I wasn't the perfect kid. Mama would be in bed and we couldn't understand him. My mother is such an energetic woman. What is she doing in bed? And then Papa would say, she doesn't feel well. And then the next morning he would call us and say, come look what Mommy has for you. And she would open up the quilt and there on a little pillow would be a baby. That's all we knew. <laughs> My father used to go there every Friday to the waterfront, to the fish market, and buy fish. And before Rosh Hashanah, he used to buy a couple of them, like carp or white fish. And when they didn't use them in the beginning, we'd bring them home and put them in a bathtub and put water in it, and they would swim around until you needed them. Before the Sabbath began at sunset, my sister and I had to come home from school and we had to get down on our knees and scrub the floors of the entire house while my mother was cooking. When everything was ready, my father would close the door and he would come in the house and everything would be spotless. Her candlesticks had been polished, the table was set, and she was waiting there for all of us to come. But then we sit down and my mother would bench lift, light the candles, say the Sabbath prayer. It was so beautiful. And we always had a real Shabbos dinner. We had the gefilte fish, homemade, right from scratch, hand chopped. We had this chicken soup with the canela dumplings. And we had the roast chicken. We used to sing Zmiros at the table. Some of the tunes, to this day we sing the same tunes at the Sabbath table. You know what latkes are? Latkes are potato pancakes. My mother, all asked Shalom, I said she should rest in peace. She had three frying pans going at one time. We all loved potato latkes. And I want you to know, not one of those pancakes ever got on the table. We used to steal them. I would talk to my mother on one side, and my sister would go over there and steal one out of the, out of the pan. My brother would steal one. They never got on the table. And that's where we used to do Hanukkah. My job was to, uh, on Passover, to grate up some of the horseradish, and of course it would get in your eyes, but I developed the technique of doing it outside of the window and I would lower the window so that it would protect my eyes. It's sort of like a laboratory and you never threw anything away. So you get the last piece of horseradish, the, the old saying, you gotta get a little blood from your knuckles in the grater. You don't throw away a piece of horseradish. We went to public school during the day and after public school we went to Hebrew school. 
I went to school and they would say, oh, I had your brother Jakey and I had your brother Paulie before you. And of course, after me, they would say that to all of my sisters and brothers. If you passed a note, that was the worst thing that could happen. The main thing my parents expected of me was to get a good education. Uh, they were devastated if I would get a C in any grade, and I got my share of Cs. But <laughs> they wanted a good education because in Russia, from where my father came from, it was very difficult for a Jewish boy to get an education. And whenever I came home with good report cards, my reward would be that I could put pennies in the pushka so I could thank God for having made me get an A. A pushka is a charity box. You know, it, it, it's all different sizes, many different sizes. And on top, there's a little slit where you can drop the coins in or bills in, whatever you want. Until I was 13 or 14, I wore short pants and long stockings and a blouse with uh, usually a tie and a Buster Brown collar, they called them. I was in high school and my girlfriend Grace and I went shopping downtown on F Street. She wanted a new dress. And Grace found a very nice dress. And we came home and she showed the dress to her mother. So her mother said, and how much did you pay for it, Grace? She said, I paid $4.99. Her mother says, $4.99? She says, Grace, do you realize I have to sell 499 loaves of bread to pay for this dress? We make a penny on a loaf, she said. You often got some new clothes for Rosh Hashanah and school. And naturally, you would get woolen clothes for the winter, and the woolen pants, they would itch, and they were horrible. And I remember sitting in that closed in synagogue in that seat that was 10 people sitting in a five-man seat sweating in the new pair of woolen pants. The well-to-do merchants belong to the 6th and I Street synagogue and the poor people belong to the 5th and I. There would be dances after Young Kipper and you would walk between to meet the girls. There were two synagogues in Southwest. Ashel was on East Street between 4th and 6th, and the synagogue was called Talbot Torah Congregation. Everything was in the neighborhood. Across the street was Morgenstein's Bakery, and then we had the butcher shop right on our block. Then you had the cheese and eggs and everything, Mr. Uh, Lifshitz, and or Mrs. Lieberman down the street. I didn't know that it was a bad neighborhood. And I never thought of it as a bad neighborhood. I do remember when they paved the streets. We had a big, big parade. And we were somebody. And uh, got the name changed to 4th Street. We played baseball on K Street. A bit to North Capitol and First Street, and uh, there was uh, uh, maybe one or two automobiles passed by in a day. Everybody had some sort of a wagon that they were selling something. The ice, the coal, the snowball man, everybody had little wagons that they pulled or had a horse pulling it. All the delivery, all the hauling, everything was by horses in those days. The uh, ice trucks, the old American ice company had a yellow truck. They had a horse and buggy. We used to chase after the trucks and jump on the back to get chips of ice off the back of the wooden truck. I can even remember the fresh, cold smell from the wet wood in the back of the truck. But you had to be very careful because the, <laughs> the horses would, uh, would have their waste material all along the street. So you had to do some broken field running to make sure you didn't step in the horse manure till you got to the back of the truck. My earliest memories are of the horses pulling the fire engines down the street and their hoofs hitting the cobblestones and the sparks would fly. <laughs> Those were my fireworks. And the horses were so huge. The watermelon man had a horse and buggy, and he had a big barrel in the back full of ice. 
and he had his favorite song, Ice Cold Watermelon, Red to the Rhine. We plug them for you in there, sweet all the time. Watermelons, red to the rind. Plug them for a nickel and sell them for a dime. And they would take a very sharp knife and with razor speed and sharpness, well, zoom, 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 and that would come a plug. They're always delicious red plugs. I mean, what could be so bad about a nice cold watermelon in the summertime? Well, it was a small town, and uh, we traveled on streetcars, which had wires overhead. They used to have a streetcar pass that was good for a week. I think the men paid a dollar for the pass. When they came home from work on Saturday night, they just threw the pass. And we would ask people as they got off the bus going home if we could have their old pass. And we would use that for Saturday night to take the bus and streetcar to Glen Echo. And if we weren't lucky enough to get enough passes, we'd get on the bus and we'd throw it out the back window. And the next kid would pick it up and get the next streetcar. And this is how we met at Glen Echo. Some of the streetcars were open, and they would go over the MacArthur Street Bridge. There was a wooden bridge, and it was a clickety-clickety-clack. And it was, it was cool because of the breeze. And everybody would wait to get to the open streetcar so they can go to Glen Echo. You, you go there, and you smell the, uh, the hot dogs and the popcorn and the thrill rides. We took the side wheeler from 7th Street Wharf down to Colonial Beach which was a five-hour trip. And um, in the summertime, my mother would rent a cottage, and we would stay there two or three weeks. Where we now have the magnificent Jefferson Memorial was a beach. We used to go down there every chance that we could during the summer. Once a year, they used to have a swimming contest and it was called the Washington, D.C. Championship Swimming Contest. My older brother, Lou, when he was 16 years old, won that contest, and it was such a thrill to all of us because we were all on the beach cheering him on, you know, and, and when he won, it was ecstatic. <laughs> I mean, these things just don't happen all the time, you know. But that beach was such an important part in our life because a lot of the beaches around the area were restricted and Jewish people were not allowed. Washington was different. We didn't have all Jewish neighborhoods like uh, Philadelphia, New York, and what have you. So you grew up playing with the kids in the neighborhood and you tried to Americanize, so to speak, uh, and be accepted into those societies. I remember one term a kid chased me down the street called me Rabbi Fishgales. Here goes Rabbi Fishgales, and I used to run away and cry, and <laughs> one of the days I just stopped, and he came up to me and I whammed him, and he stopped calling me Rabbi Fishgales. Many years ago, when Washington had its own Major League Baseball team, we had the Washington Senators. I was a fanatic on baseball. I was a real tomboy. And they used to have what they called Ladies' Day on certain Friday afternoons at Griffith Stadium. Those were the only times that I was excused from scrubbing the floors on Friday afternoons. I was allowed to go to Ladies' Day at Griffith Park. I was in the cadets, I had a uniform, and uh, I enjoyed it. At the end of the year, there was a competition, and they had retired Army officers to be judges to see which of the companies were the best drilled companies. We went on a drill field, and the band played Sousa's marches, and we performed all of our orders, and the judges marched up and down our ranks and interrogated me. In comes the second day with a stands full with maybe 25,000 people, Griffith Stadium, every single cadet massed on the field. It was a tense moment because the adjutant would march in the direction of the winning captain. And the adjutant came to me and says, Captain, you won the drill. He, he, he forgot the formalities. His name was Morris Fox. He says, Sonny, you won the drill. Bring your company up and get your medal. And the students went wild. Just imagine what this meant to the citizens of Washington, D.C., the Jewish citizens. 
the heart of our social life was the old Jewish Community Center at 16th and Q Street. We used to go swimming there. We had our club meetings there. I took elocution and dramatic lessons there. And they used to have dances there all the time. And we used to go as groups. Then, of course, when I started dating a little bit, my date and I would go down there because the whole town was there. That's where everybody met. Chevy Chase Lake. We used to go out there on Saturday to dance to Meyer Davis's band, and they had two dance floors, and he had two bands so that you could dance in either one, but it cost you 10 cents a dance. And then you could buy a bottle of Coca-Cola for five cents and have a big evening. Stardust was our song. In the mood, Chattanooga Choo Choo, Pennsylvania. We used to go to all these dances and we used to do the shag. I don't know if you know what the shag is. It was a very happy jitterbug. And then after the dance, we would go to the hot shop up at Georgian Geranium Street and go home. Most of the time, one couldn't or didn't even attempt to say goodnight to a girl and kiss her. You just waited till her father opened the door and let her in. Oh, yes. We were very sheltered. Nothing like today. I mean, our uh, riskiest part of life was buying a magazine, possibly called True Life, and sneak it under our mattress, you know. But we were quite innocent, and most of us virgins when we got married, and very naive about sex life altogether. If we were going steady, then maybe there was a little bit of petting out in the car and so forth and so on. And uh, if you weren't going steady, uh, good night, thank you, a, a quick kiss and goodbye. Of course, the car would always leak. I remember aside, I used to put tar on the top of the roof and the car would leak when the converter would just leak. And my date would scream, she said, you know, the water's coming through this car. Her and I reached back, I had an umbrella. I used to drive down the street with an umbrella open up inside the car. Well, when I was young, I was known as a jazz singer. My older brother Lou played banjo and guitar, and he used to accompany me. And I really wanted to go on the stage. But my mother insisted that nice, Jewish girls didn't go on the stage. And I said, Mom, look at Sophie Tucker, look at Molly Pecan. They have a wonderful life. And she said, no, I don't want you to go on the stage. And they insisted that I go to college instead. And in those days, girls listened to the parents. And I went to college. I was making a tremendous 1440 a year, and uh, then I got raised to 1620 a year. That was really nice money in those days. He was making ten dollars a week in his father's store. Some friend said there's a new thing going on, accountancy. We never heard of it. What is it? Well, it has to do with business. Keeps business going. Everybody who is it's got a good business, got to have an accountant. So we both entered Pace and Pace and we graduated and became accountants. The female in the Jewish home then was really raised to marry a nice Jewish boy. It's great if he's a doctor, a lawyer, accountant, raise children, and, and this is important. There was a new development put up by one of the leading real estate companies, and we were not so politely told by a salesman that no Jews were invited there. They would not sell to Jews. My folks bought this small building across the street from the store, and my office was on the second floor when we got married in 1939. That was our first residence. And the reception room became our living room. And then we had a little kitchen in back. 
here I was again living with the store. And family was very important. And interaction in the neighborhood, it was a community. And I think after I got married and you lived so much by yourself in the house, you didn't go out to talk to neighbors, I missed that so much. My parents had a way of life and set an example. And Judaism was interwoven into it and a part of it. When you're born to such a family, you take on all the colorations. And you hope in turn to pass them on to your children and pass them on to their children. There was a, a Rabbi Lux, and, uh, and they used to learn, come to his house and learn. They weren't as good as me, these boys. The one day they came into the house there, and he saw that Rabbi Lux was sleeping. He had a, had a white beard, long white beard. And I'm telling you, maybe I shouldn't tell you, but I mean, you can throw it out if you want to. They glued his beard to the table. Really? Really? But I mean, finally, it, it, it came out. I mean, he was all right. It just that the beard was a little shorter after he cut it, after he cut it off, you know, put it off the table. But it, it grew back. <laughs> 